everyone. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Um, we're excited to have you tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Krista Robley. I'm the Enrollment Manager at the Institute of Design. Um, and just to start, I wanted to kind of briefly provide you with some background information on who we are um, and certainly, you know, lead us into tonight's conversation. Um, for those of you who are a new audience, oop, there we go. Um, the Institute of Design, um, also called ID. So if you hear ID, that's most likely what we're talking about. Um, we are a, uh, a graduate school located in Chicago, Illinois. Um, and we were actually founded as the new Bauhaus um, over 80 years ago uh, by Laszlo Maholy Naj. Um, and we really are known for pioneering human-centered design and systems design. And you will hear from um, some of our alum and a current student tonight, um, and they'll talk all about their work in this space. Um, we are a graduate school, um, and certainly, you know, the we, we actually are the only design school in the U.S. that is solely devoted to graduate level students. We don't have an undergraduate program, which makes us um, a little bit different, um, but we are certainly more than just a graduate school. Um, as an institute, you know, we measure our impact at the societal level. And I think you'll hear particularly, you know, a lot about this tonight. Um, you know, we believe that design can be used to, you know, navigate, conquer really complex problems. Um, we believe it can be used to direct creativity, um, mobilize action, address some of the biggest um, and stickiest issues that we face in a society, which as you know, we've seen this year, there's, there's, there's a lot that <laughs> needs to be solved. And, and I think we, we feel design is a really powerful tool in that. Um, you know, with that being said, that's exactly why we created these events, these Explore ID series of events. We've had a few this semester. We'll continue to have them throughout, you know, all of next year as well. Um, it's really a, a way for us to showcase the really interesting and diverse work that our students, faculty, alum, partners, broader design community, you know, are really um, doing. Um, and these events really give us a chance to show that work and have discussions about it. And, you know, we wanna hear from you too. We've got the chat function here tonight. You know, if you work in this space and you wanna add on to what's being discussed, we'd love to hear from you. I think, you know, that's that's um, why, we, why we get together for these chats. Um, on that note, uh, tonight's event, as you've seen, is focused on uh, civic design. And so we have, uh, students, alum, um, who work um, in the government space, and they will talk a little bit more about probably their time at, at ID, but more importantly, you know, what, uh, how it's sort of translated into their work since and the impact they've been able to make um, within the civic space. Um, so with that being said, um, I'm going to pass it over to Evan Chan. Uh, he's a Master of Design alum himself from 2019, um, and he's going to be our moderator for this evening. So Evan, over to you. Great, thanks, Krista. Just making sure I'm off mute. Uh, we've got a fantastic uh, group of panelists today with great variety and really, really excited for this conversation. Uh, first, you see on the left, we have Steve Babich. Uh, he's the head of artificial intelligence at the US Technolo uh, Technology Transformation Service. Also a, an ID grad from 2007. Next, we have Shannon Delaney with us, uh, for, who is a design strategist for the city of Durham, uh, formerly the Bloomberg Philanthropies Innovation Team, if you're familiar with those. And she's a graduate from 2018. Uh, lastly, we have Catalina Prada. Uh, she is uh, a summer fellow uh, for, with the city of Boston, the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics. So she is still in ID and will be um, ID's first graduate with the, uh, M the dual MDES and MBA program. And then, uh, and then you have me, uh, the moderator uh, here. I'll jump in uh, at times, but really just helping to facilitate the conversation along. Uh, I am a um, design, you know, just like, it's almost like we make up these terms, uh, design researcher and strategist uh, at uh, Deloitte, uh, Deloitte Digital. Um, I uh, graduated in 2019 uh, with the MDES and the Certificate in Public Administration. So really excited for this conversation. Um, Krista, are we staying on this one or is there a different, are we gonna have to stare at our faces? Okay, great. <laughs> Wasn't sure if we would just. Um, so we wanted to start this conversation um, 
in a concrete, in, in, in making civic design as concrete as possible right from the get go. Uh, and to talk a little bit about uh, the current projects that we're working on. Um, but just before we do that, I want to uh, do a little bit of level setting. Uh, firstly, if you have questions uh, for this, uh, that you love to, for us to, to, to discuss in the Q&A section after our, after our panel discussion, um, we kindly ask that uh, you don't put them in the chat. We'd love, love to keep that um, channel for uh, sort of a side conversations. Uh, but if you look over to the right of that icon, there's um, uh, two text bubbles uh, for Q&A. And that's where you can put in your, your questions and Krista and Kristen will be monitoring that. And then we'll, we'll discuss some of those uh, at, uh, at the end, the Q&A section. Um, now coming to civic design, one thing that I just wanted to um, mention is that um, when we talk about design and government, um, there, uh, there is something of a delineation uh, between um, how it's applied at the federal level and then how it's applied at the state and local level. Um, and there are um, many similarities, but of course, uh, as, we, as we discussed and who our panelists are here today, uh, we have a good range and that's something to keep, keep um, kind of keep in the back of your mind. The, the scale uh, of uh, the federal government is obviously much larger and there's a lot that, uh, that carries with it. And then of course the complexity as well, both of the government agencies, uh, the processes, et cetera, as well as again, with the scale being larger, that makes for much, much deeper complexity. Uh, of course, Steve and I uh, have a little bit of, I have a little bit of experience. He has a lot more experience um, at the federal level, um, bringing design there. And then we have uh, Shannon and Catalina uh, on the, the, the local level, kind of that, that um, local government level. Um, so just something to keep in the back of your mind as we continue in this conversation. Okay, so what does civic design look like? Shannon, I'd love to turn uh, the mic over to you first uh, to tell us a little bit about what you're currently doing or some of the more uh, recent projects that, that stand out. Sure, um, thanks Evan. And uh, so I'm Shannon, I work for the city. Uh, so I'm working at a municipal level and a lot of my work is very community facing. Basically half of my work faces the community and so a lot of work that departments within the city I work with um, rely on our team and, and myself to bring qualitative research and um, engagement into development, whether it's new services or improving processes that aren't working well. Um, a lot of my work right now is prioritizing COVID related um, challenges and responding to those needs. So uh, there's a lot of new appetite for making uh, services and processes low or no touch, which is a real bright spot. Um, <clears throat> there's also a lot of mm, community and organizational like collaboration around bringing um, food pantries together um, and just the more scrappier parts that I think the designers are really well suited for um, and government doesn't always know where to start. So that's kind of where I come in. Thanks Shannon. How about we turn it to Catalina? Love to hear, hear what you're up to. Sure. Uh, so similar to Shannon, I'm at the municipal level right now. I continue to work with uh, the Office of New Urban Mechanics at the City of Boston. And previously I worked with SMRURL Fellow with the City of Chicago. And what my day-to-day -day work right now with the City of Boston is, uh, one is I'm working with the Office of Food Access uh, in what Shannon literally mentioned, so like bringing things together and putting a program together and scaling a program that we have for SNAP beneficiaries or food stamps. And recently I just joined another program, a project with a startup to promote business recovery for COVID. So uh, right now at the municipal level, we're completely COVID uh, devoted and that's what we're doing right now. 
Great, thanks, Catalina. Steve? Yeah, sure, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, good to be with all of you. Uh, looks like we have quite a good crowd. Um, and yes, the government problems are complex uh, up and down from uh, federal, state, and local level. Like it, it gets pretty complex on, in, in all fronts for sure. So, and I think cities are also a great place where that locus of activity really happens. So um, it's great to just uh, see a lot of this sort of still developing and, and, and happening in a lot of different cities and ways. So, um, but for what I do, I, um, my current role is, like I said, uh, like Evan mentioned, head of artificial intelligence for the US Tech Transformation Service. Uh, our mission really is to accelerate the use of AI in government. And so we're not trying to do AI for the country per se, but more with an inward uh, towards federal agencies. How are they using and adopting AI uh, and placing greater emphasis in, in investments to drive better insights, make better decisions, and make sure we do it in, in really a responsible manner. And so that's, that's, what we're, that's what I'm focused on right now. Uh, prior to that, I was a presidential innovation fellow, started in 2015, uh, and I was detailed to the FBI. Uh, the project I was working on had to do with information sharing, uh, which sounds like a, it's like, okay, well, what does that mean? Uh, well, it, it has, it's quite a complex domain where it has to do with how does the FBI work with industry and different companies to share information related to threats so that we can better mitigate those threats and get ahead of them and, and hopefully prevent the crime or attack, the full range of crimes and attacks that occur. Um, and really from, you know, coming from ID and design perspective, essentially it was almost like a product lead, uh, but making sure that the information itself was really timely, relevant and actionable. Uh, and so in, in this case, the product was yes, the process by which we share information, the mechanisms, but actually the intelligence itself. So. That's just a quick, quick summary of uh, what I've been up to. Great, thanks, Steve. And, and uh, I can share also, um, give you all a snippet of what I'm currently working on. Um, I'm currently working with a state insurance fund, uh, which is um, related to workers' compensation insurance. Uh, and we are completely redoing their um, policyholder, policyholder web portal. Um, so, I was brought in to do um, that initial piece of research uh, to understand uh, what what do policyholders need, what what is not working with the current system or the, the, the current portal, um, and really translate that into um, clear direction for uh, for the the development team uh, that will be actually building this out. So that's what it looks like from my perspective. Um, I'd love to. Uh, shift the conversation to talk a little bit about what the environment is or the context in which uh, civic design uh, comes into. Obviously, we're talking about it being the public sector, uh, the government, but, uh, but let's, let's dive a little bit more deeply into that. Um, of course, innovation and design are, are two terms that get thrown around a lot, uh, very buzzwordy, um, but what exactly does that mean um, in, in this context of government. Uh, Shannon, uh, Steve, maybe I'll turn this question to you first. Sure. Uh, look, I think design, it, obviously it has its roots in the private sector, um, developing products, whether it's a phone or a laptop or a piece of furniture, you name it. Um, but inevitably that is slowly bled into the public and social and civic space. And so when even if we go back to the dawn or the, the initiation of the, the PIF program, Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, that was 2012. And so you had pioneers in government. We had Todd Park, who was the CTO of the United States at the time, we got the ear of the president and said, why don't we try an experiment where we bring in um, tech design and then now that's evolving to data science uh, uh, and other kinds of skill sets. Why don't we just bring in people from industry who are on the cutting edge and have them work alongside federal agencies to tackle national problems. And so that was, you know, that's 2012. And now we've been ongoing, uh, actually in the first year, if you remember healthcare.gov blew up uh, and that was a potential real challenge for the president, President Obama at the time. Uh, but Todd Park uh, grabbed a few of the fellows, folks for who eventually became US Digital Service got in there and really fixed it and did it in a more user-centered way. And so those kinds of wins, certainly for the president at the time, 
gave a lot of um, runway to the PIF program. US Digital Service was expanded, was established from there. ATF, which many of you might be more familiar with as well. These are all sort of organizations that have sprouted up across the federal government. Um, and so again, I mean, I'll let Catalina and Shannon speak to like the Bloomberg and the city, city work that's going on too, but it's certainly something that is, is, is much more well understood over the last five years or so. Jump in. Um, yeah, please. Thank you for reminding me of the Bloomberg because I, I don't operate in that mindset anymore. But I, I think from the context that I'm in, certainly that that paved the way for a lot of what, first of all, why I'm in Durham. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies has a network um, of innovation teams where they were doing a lot of the heavy lifting, spreading the word about design. Um, and design as more than just communication design and like technology solutions, um, more of a yes and, and, and a lot more uh, integrated into to these multidisciplinary teams, which, which I think really did my team a huge favor. Um, that's not to say that there's, there's still not been a long, um, introduction into what it is that we do and the value that we add on a, on a municipal level. Um, and we're off the grant now. So we're sort of integrated into uh, the Office of Performance and Innovation. And I just, I wanna acknowledge that like every city and, and Catalina can speak to this too, but like not every city is gonna have an office that has this role. And so you have to be um, kind of creative when you're looking for openings into what, what it is, you know, design could be in that particular institution. And, um, I'm not trying to cheat the, the Q and A section, but I just noticed like, how do you find these jobs? And it's, I just want to acknowledge that, that it's, you, you kind of have to look, sometimes they're like performance or continuous improvement, or like, there's always some kind of office. And I think they're popping up more and more where, this kind of role and these kinds of skills are desired, but government is still tends to be a little slow to understand that language. Um, and <clears throat> I think, I mean, I'm, I'll let Catalina talk because <laughs> I think that's, that covers my head. So I've got the privilege of being in a team that's been running 10 years since now. Yeah, 2010. So New Urban Mechanics is 10 years old. Um, and what we discuss is like the, there's always designers in cities. We just don't name them. Yeah. Uh, they don't have the title of designers, but cities work for people. So although they sometimes fail and don't do it as some of our best uh, practices do, they're, they're still doing and creating spaces for participation and for people to plug in into the policy uh, process. And from what Shannon was saying is, yeah, I think regarding the jobs and everything, like we need to be open. We, for example, at least in the new urban mechanics, uh, we collaborate a lot with departments and that's because they, it's just a, a capacity building as well. Uh, and sometimes you just see that spot that you might come in as fill in the title and you're a designer and you bring the capacity and that's where you, it's sort of like you make your, the role yourself and you start bringing these capacities into the city without uh, like really the title needing to be design strategist. So I think yeah. that's a bit of what I've seen in the city, both in Chicago and Boston. Um, and Catalina, Catalina and Shannon, I'd love to know, is there a particular way that you've seen the, the innovation team where you are uh, communicate to the other departments and agencies, uh, you know, who, what they do, what the value they bring is, etc. cetera? Uh, yes, there's a lot of experimenting. <laughs> Some of it's just doing the work and then sharing that work out as best you can. And 
um, it's understanding that resources are, are tight. And so the part of the strategy in design strategy is like understanding your, your audience and like your next move, especially when you're new. And when we, my team got off the, the grant funding, um, you know, there's, there's a step into, now we don't have this like, like big fancy money that we can like play around with we're using like government funds. And so we had to be very like sensitive to how we were communicating the value that we were adding to goals that, that already existed and like the concerns. And, and um, so it's, it's doing the work, it's finding the, your champions early uh, and then like celebrating those wins as, as often uh, and as best you can to people who might then be able to connect the dots um, because a lot of it, at least in, in the context that I'm in is um, we're like an internal consultant um, that's married to the institution. So we can't leave. And um, so we just have to think about like, okay, this, we might do something that might not be like totally in our wheelhouse right now with the intention of doing this, like, you know, more intensive, you know, service design or, or innovation, um, once the trust is, is there and they can see a little bit about what we do. I can speak like definitely experimentation. Like I think that's what defines Monum, Monum standing for New Urban Mechanics. Mm -hmm. um, they are sort of, that's the way they sell themselves. And they do a lot of pilots and try out new things with startups and with uh, universities. And that's the way they bring it to other departments as well, because it's they're, they're taking a bit of the risk of the departments and is they're risking the investment that departments would need to do that. And I can speak, for example, uh, on March, uh, they tried out a chatbot for delivering food and that was sponsored by Monum probably the Office of Food Access wouldn't have gone that way if it wasn't for Monum that had the connection. And from what Shannon is saying, it's just like having the champions and having the connections, at least at the office, there is a huge network that we rely on, uh, both at the department level and outside of the city, just because doing those connections is just so valuable uh, even pointing someone to another person that might make the deal, like make the change, that's a long way. You've already gotten a long way. So that's also the value that these offices bring into the city, at least in Boston. Mm. Turn it over to you or Stephen, I don't know. Yeah, Steve, I'm, I'm curious if there's any anything along this um, experiences you've had or things you've seen. Uh, in, in making these new connections effectively, uh, getting buy-in from, from uh, leaders either within, you know, the, the area that you're, you're currently working or in adjacent uh, other, other agencies that's, yeah. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. I mean, picture this, like you're, as a fellow, you're stepping into one, the government from industry. So that's a completely different landscape. Two, you're in a new program, you're dropped into a new agency. In this case, it was the first time we were working with the FBI. And then, you know, day one was going down three levels below ground or so. And, you know, in some cinder block room and, and I'm looking at wireframes of a portal that should, that they wanted to build to gather a bunch of information that the Bureau had that could, that could then be disseminated to uh, industry so that they can defend themselves. And so we're sort of like, you're, you're just inundated with acronyms, jargon, just understanding the different divisions within the Bureau, whether it's cyber or counterterrorism or criminal division, et cetera. And it's just like an absolute fire hose that's coming at you. And you're, you know, you walk out and you're like probably sweating a little bit after what you've just been through. And, you know, it's the same thing in the, in the city level, state level. I mean, you just sort of like, okay, how do I, get in, how do I understand this space, understand what they're trying to accomplish and then figure out, is this the right thing that we should be building? And then, and then, right, and then you go back to your roots of like design, the things that we really learn at ID and elsewhere. It's like, all right, what is the problem we are trying to solve? 
what are some framing questions that we really need to answer to get at the crux of the issues that we're, we're grappling with? Like, what does it mean to do effective information sharing? What are the mechanisms by which uh, most successful information sharing occurs? How often does it happen? These sorts of questions. And then you start to, then you get, you scope out research, like who do we need to talk to within the Bureau? Agents, analysts, senior officials, et cetera. People in industry, oh, by the way, yes, the users, the companies uh, that the Bureau is serving, so to speak. And all of that is just at all, all within that context, you're trying to find allies along the way who sort of begin to understand this kind of approach and why being more user-centered and having empathy for the different perspectives matters. So, I mean, that that takes, you know, weeks and, and some uh, a couple of few months just to sort of coalesce around, okay, here's the opportunity that we see. Uh, but I mean, that's that's what it was like, but it's very, it's very real. And it happens not just at the Bureau, but other places like the Veterans Affairs where uh, now VA.gov has stood up as a, as a wholly more unifying experience in terms of how vet veterans can access their benefits, uh, whether it's healthcare or in addition to healthcare, um, that same dynamic plays out for sure. Mm. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a little slice of what it was like on day one, month one, a yeah. uh, few weeks in. One, one thing I'd, I'd love to um, get your thoughts on, uh, what, one thing that I've experienced, um, and I think a lot of this uh, with, with myself being um, in, in consulting, uh, there's something about the, the uh, contracting process that um, uh, kind of uh, pigeonholes the projects in a certain way. Uh, what I mean by that is um, the agency puts out the request for proposal, the RFP, right? And then, um, and then, and then, of course, you know, Deloitte says, you know, oh yeah, we can do that, you know. Um, but, but the the thing that's um, uh, typically absent from that process is what you just talked about, uh, Steve, which is that framing of what the problem is, right? Because in a sense, the the agency has already, you know, they know what it is, right? Of course, I mean, they they just every, everyone, you know, we've. We've been doing this for decades. We know what the problem is. This is, we need a new, you know, web portal, you know, um, who can build it for us. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear for any of you all, um, any of you, you panelists, just your thoughts on, on um, this, this uh, uh, progression. Is it, is it, you know, we've learned so much about framing the problem and asking the right questions, but oftentimes the, the, the projects that we see and, and perhaps are a part of, um, they, they kind of are, that, that part has already been done, so to speak. Who do you want, who do you want to answer first, Devin? Steven, you go. All right, I'll, I'll start, but uh, you better weigh in, Catalina and Shannon, for sure. Um, I, yeah, I mean, framing the problem is incredibly important. If you're, not on the right mountain, so to speak, everything from there, you're, you're just going in the wrong direction. Uh, and so that's extraordinarily important. And um, that's, I think that's the value that design thinking to people like uh, designers can bring to the table is the willingness and the confidence to challenge the conventional wisdom or the thinking in the room, because I could tell you right off the bat, when we, we were gonna be working with this contractor, I didn't even know they were contractors until like a, a week in or a couple days in at least. And they were saying, they were everyone, I mean, this was coming from Director Comey at the time all the way down. Like we need, private sector is a huge priority for us. Post 9-11, the intelligence community started to figure out how to share information with itself. Industry is the next frontier. And so there's a lot of pressure to, to make sure that we build this shiny digital thing. But when we started to engage with different users and stakeholders, we were hearing a common theme of like, look, there are real risks and challenges for why people are not sharing into a portal because they're worried about PII, personally identifiable information or compromising ongoing investigation. Uh, and this is on, on both sides, bureau and industry. And so when you get at those kinds of issues, then you start to say, well, maybe a portal is not the right thing. And I'll give you a very concrete example and the use of the value of like design tools and, and, and like little kits and, and, and prompts that we use in design. We came up with these um, 
ecosystem cards of what information sharing looks like, everything from completely decentralized to completely centralized, like meaning the Bureau is the center of all information that comes in and then we disseminate it out or like multiple hubs and spokes. And this is just, we put these cards on the table and ask users to uh, tell us what's, in, uh, how does information sharing happen most effectively? And they all pointed to multiple hubs, multiple spokes, meaning different seats at different tables. This is the world of information sharing where companies have their trusted networks and it's not centralized at all. And so why I bring that up is that has a tectonic shift for how you think about information sharing and being able to say, this is what people are pointing to completely challenged the conventional wisdom in the room when we were meeting with a senior, a couple of senior officials in the bureau. And while the contractor is trying to talk about the value of a portal, I just dropped these cards on the table and he looked at it and said like, do you have something to say, Steve? And we just sort of spoke to the rationale for why we are sharing this kind of uh, insight and why this is a different way to go. That to me is like design tools and methodologies like in action and it, it changes the way they think about it. Wow. That was a really smart answer. Um, I'll follow up <laughs> with more of a, um, I, I'm trying, I was like trying to just dig in my, my head about that. Um, um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading another question. Evan, can you restate the original question that you just sure. asked? Sure, yeah. The question was related to um, if you typically have the opportunity to, to, to frame um, oh. the problem uh, or if, if it's something that's kind of handed to you. And, and, and of course, now the second time that I mentioned the question, it's significantly more clear than the first time. Uh, when I that passed it to Steve. Definitely that was what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think, um, I think that, like knowing when to bring in tools. So sometimes a, a department will approach us for like, can you, is this what you do? Can you just do this for us? And then, um, you know, depending on time and resources that we're allotted, we can we can back up and, and sort of similar to how Stephen was talking about, like offer these tools of reflection that m they might not have thought they needed or um, just didn't just didn't have those available to them. So it can be as simple as um, bringing those key stakeholders into a room for an initial meeting, but visualizing um the process out um so they might have a solution already in mind but we you know we do this journey map or this service blueprint sort of thing and then all of a sudden there's a conversation available because you'd be surprised at how many times like you know the left hand doesn't know what the right is doing and um it's such a cool simple straightforward tool that makes sense to everyone in the room and you don't have to be equipped with anything else besides just knowing what your part of the process looks like. And all of a sudden you have this holistic view and then you can start asking the question of, is this actually the, what, you know, what we want to do or what, what's going around here earlier in the process. Um, and then, you know, you could talk about feasibility and like, well, we have a technology solution, but actually maybe it might be just you know, switching something else, and and you just sort of read the room, I guess, um, depending on who who's in the room with you. But um, another thing that we do in Durham is uh, sort of, I mean, teaching capacity building. So we use these like external small projects that <clears throat> we teach those tools on how to you know write a problem statement. Um, and then, you know, kind of work backwards and just understanding how you're thinking about the problem. And so the hope is, and I think what, what we've seen so far is that, that people, that just makes sense to people. It's just when you're in the muck of things, it's really hard. And sometimes you just need a mediator to pull you out and say like, it's okay to like breathe and actually like step back. Um, and so providing the space to do that is sometimes all you need. I can plug in a bit there also from Monum. 
just because one acts as a department, it's not in the innovation department, but it's like a sweet spot there. And we are cherished just because we make the uncomfortable questions. And that's sort of like, I think part of the value, I think also design brings is like making that uncomfortable question that sometimes people, so like that are in the day-to-day -day work, but like don't feel comfortable doing it. And I think we are used to dealing with complexity and dealing with this uncertainty and we just do the question and with not ill, like not ill mannered, but it's just like, we're able to do those questions. And then bringing those, that information into the table is very valuable and can simply just one very good question really change the conversation and change what the solution was. Um, yeah. We've been reflecting upon really what the, the value of a consultant brings and how, what Shannon mm -hmm. was saying, like literally framing, we might do the framing before we go out uh, just because there's a process inside the public sector that needs to be done in order for that RFP to go into life. But that doesn't mean that the department is completely set on how it should look like. So I think that's where you, Evans, are like when you design the web portal, you have a bit of a leeway in what you do, depending on what, what department you're working with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As I was say, I mean, what, Shan, what you're both describing, and again, it's the use of whether it's a something that's on the wall to facilitate yeah. the discussion, to get people on the same page, like metaphorically, but literally, so that you find out those silos that existed. I mean, I had that experience in working in insurance when it was Humana, um, but that, that, that's, those, that's, what, that's where design methods and tools like you described uh, come in, whether it's the card, service blueprint, et cetera, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a few things that, that you all said that really stood out to me that I think really come together. Steve, you said something, uh, a term you used is designers have, um, or they should have, the confidence to challenge conventions, right? That's fantastic. And um, Shannon, you mentioned uh, this matter of having a holistic view, right? Kind of putting something up, but then it's a tool for reflection. And, and Catalina, you mentioned that they, you know, um, many of the folks within um, government roles may not have spent the time to reflect. So by presenting something that provides that space for them to kind of look more broadly and to really step back and reflect really opens that conversation uh, to not just be so, so stuck in uh, this, is the, this is what we need, this is how it should be done, but rather let's, let's pause and really consider. Um, we, we have a few, um, We've got some curiosity, uh, uh, Krista's Brent mentioning in, in the chat related to uh, what are some of the key skills uh, that we found valuable in this um, in, in, in this space of civic design. I think this is, this is actually a great segue into the next section um, about what, what, is, what is the role um, and or qualities uh, of, of an effective civic designer. Who's first, Evan? <laughs> uh, Steve, you smiled first. So, <laughs> and then Shannon smiled second. So oh, we're, I can't we're go that. first. Uh, I can't <laughs> always go. Uh, well, we, can, we, can, we can pass to Shannon if, if that's fine. Yeah. Um, well, there's a, there's a lot. I think an active listening definitely comes, comes to mind. Um, and I'm, I'm keeping that in mind with what Steve said about the confidence um to challenge <laughs> confidence to challenge conventions. conventions yeah it there's like this healthy balance somewhere of humility and pushing um against the grain um especially when you're working with maybe not individuals who are risk adverse but it's just the climate is generally going to lean towards safety and security and like um so i think the better we can really listen and not not start the conversation with a strong agenda but really understanding um you know bringing bringing the tools of empathy and um not just using that as like a we have these empathy building tools 
but like really meta style going in and like understanding your your stakeholders and like what their concerns are and what their unmet needs are and how they're framing the challenges and um a lot of it is about facilitating conversations that might not be able to just occur without you in the room so you are you know, my experience has been you become the tool yourself <laughs> to bridge those conversations and and that like nothing makes me happier than when i don't really have to do a whole lot because i have like really brilliant people i mean there's some really like brilliant people that i just have no idea you know you're working with like anything solid waste audit like budget um finance like that it, it's just there's no way that you can know all of the content and like the people that have spent years and years learning their craft um so it's like threading those together and like weaving um i don't know so like the humility and the the confidence to like know when to push it's it's a learned practice i think that is very contextual um but it's a really it's a really good skill that you you learn it at id i think because there's so much practice that you're able to um just like be like a stone in the river with that until <laughs> you um polish it but you're, i'm always learning so so just to clarify your your um what you're talking about is for you to play the role of, of maybe a facilitator, uh, someone who really brings uh, the expertise of others together and, and, and kind of weaving their knowledge and, and creating something um, uh, by bringing them together. Is, is, that, is that what you're getting at, please? That's, that's a big part of it, yeah. Um, and that's also, I think people bring in their strengths. I, I humbly say that's part, that's my strength, I think. And that's what I find joy in. Um, other people might be really good on your feet thinkers about like, I got just the tool and, you know, they come in with that and, and that alleviates the tension in the same way that my, my home skills do, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's just a matter of like playing to your strengths and like reading the room and, um, and then also creating things like designers are inherently visual creatures. And so or that's a lot of times, even if we don't think we are, you're probably one of the rare people in the room who are working with visual tools. Like there's a lot of notepads and Excel sheets where I am. And so people get really excited when there's more than just like words and bullets on a presentation. Um, so like, don't underestimate those, those tools. Yeah. Catalina or Steve, any, any other thoughts on roles, uh, the role or qualities of an, an effective city, civic designer? Catalina, you wanna go? No? I can go. <laughs> um, so one thing that I, I would mention is you're a diplomat and you need to, I think Shannon uh, sort of like mentioned this and as a facilitator you do need to be aware of who are you connecting and how you're connecting them so it's not only about bridging knowledge you're also bridging people and being aware of that uh, especially for example when you do it inside the public sector like it's pretty easy but you're also bridging people outside the public sector and you need to take care of the, those connections and how you make those connections and how you follow up with them uh, I think there's also a craft in that. Uh, and the other thing is just creating alliances. Sometimes somebody in the department, as Shannon mentioned, like in food waste, might not know somebody in budget and just having that connection done and that alliance, even if it's inside, but also outside. People, like the amount of connections that I've made because Monum knows someone in X, organization, which is nothing related to the Office of Food Access and the amount of work that I've been able to do just because there's this network, it's just amazing. So you as a network builder, uh, inside and outside, I, I totally emphasize in that it's not only inside the public sector. When you're in the public sector, you're 
inside, but you also need to be uh, connecting to the outside. Yeah, I mean, again, both the things you brought up are, uh, agree, like empathy, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> This is, we're increasingly in a world where we keep talking past each other. And uh, that is immensely frustrating at times. And it provides, but it's also an opportunity to reintroduce the notion of listening to each other and, and building some level of empathy for the people who are living the problem every day. Um, and if you could do that with a level of authenticity, and I guess part of what I mean by that is like, you could, learn as much about the problem that they're dealing with and the issues at, at, at play as much as you can. Because if you start to describe that in the context of listening to it at the same time, you are absolutely building a level of rapport that will cause that user or that stakeholder uh, in government or outside to say, you really get it. Because um, if I'm talking in my current role to the chief data officer of the Department of Transportation, or if I'm in the FBI and I'm talking with an agent, agents, you know, they're I kind of, the analogy is like a hospital, like who rules hospitals? Physicians do. Well, in the FBI, who rules? It's the agents. It's the one with, well, frankly, the guns. Um, that's just the nature of the place. But if you can get an agent to be on your side and show them you really get what their, um, get what their world is like, you have made a very loyal, um, Ad, ally and, and advocate at that point, and they will they will um, go to the mat for you. They will they will advocate for you and introduce you to others in the organization that you need to get to, and that absolutely happens. Um, so that I mean that's that's soft skills, but I think again, user research, conducting interviews, you'll learn that stuff at ID for sure. And then it is I think it, I, don't, I think it might have been Shannon. It, it, it's a skill that you develop over time, like how to listen, how to interview people, how to really connect with someone, even if it's not an interview, it's just you're trying to connect with a, a stakeholder or an ally uh, that you're trying to build. Those things really matter. Yeah, that, that, um, that really gives a great uh, um, a detail, uh, even a vivid picture as to what it can look like to, to build the connections that Catalina was talking about, right? It's not, mm -hmm. not necessarily as simple as, um, it's not just it's not just networking, right? It's not like oh, send out you know a bunch oh. of emails, but but really connecting on a genuine level yep. um, to to really build allies um, as you go along the way. Absolutely, and I can you know um, an example of that, like not even having I was gonna, I was working with FBI San Francisco quite a bit because uh, we were working um, talking to Silicon Valley companies. But having to get on the phone and not meet the head of cyber division in San Francisco and talk through why, why should he care about what I'm going to do or try to do by talking with a certain group of companies that are he, extraordinarily, he's, he's very protective of these companies and the relationships. But if you're able to describe the issues, the challenges and, and convey to them, here's how we like to approach it. Here's my understanding of the problem. And then you, it resonates with that, uh, in this case, head of cyber there again, that's at least opening the door to trust. And then when you get out there and meet and you discuss and, and work through and, and meet with the companies, et cetera, then you can start to see, okay, you are, you are a friend of mine also, uh, and I'm willing to trust you uh, and take the next step. So again, just trying to give like a little color of like what, it, what it's really like, um, that's how it happens. Yeah, and, and it's, um, that's a great segue uh, we just got great segues for days um, <laughs> where it's, it, it's not just um, about the, the skills of doing the work um, of, you know, whether it be design, innovation, whatever you want to call it, but it's, it's understanding um, what outcome is, is this stakeholder that I'm working with seeking and how can I communicate how, what I bring can help to achieve that outcome, right? Uh, you know, I, I think we, we spend so much time uh, just from, from, you know, when I was at ID, we spend a lot of time learning the methods and, and that's really, really important. Um, but, uh, but we do, pe people aren't, you know, clients aren't, aren't as much cared with, uh, they don't as much care about how you'll do something, but 
but really what's the end result going to be? How are you going to get me what I want, right? So how can we communicate and, and shape our story uh, that way? Um, okay, yeah. And, and so the next section um, was really how, what impact, what is the impact that a civic designer can have? What are some success stories that you've seen? Um, and, and I think baked within this question is, is um, not, not just what, what successful outcomes have we had, but, but also to some degree, how, um, how is success defined? Uh, either, you know, we as designers may have a certain definition of, oh, you know, I, you know, we care about the end user, right? It's, it's about them. Um, but, but what about even some of, some of the, the clients or key stakeholders that we've, um, that you all have interacted with? Do they have the same definition or, or is it a bit different? Catalina, I don't think we started with you yet. <laughs> uh, so I've got a couple of things there. So definitely the end user, you're always thinking about doing for the constituents the best. Uh, but in Monum, there's also a success is that what learnings do we have from the pilots that are run? And the great practice that Monum has at the end of any pilot that's being done is writing up what happened, how did it happen, how, what exactly were the learnings and how can it be improved in the future? Just having that moment of reflection after each pilot, not only builds to the success of what you're doing, but creates internal knowledge of what's, what's already been done and where to start. Uh, I had the advantage, like I had really the opportunity to be part of one of those reflections during the summer. And during the summer, I was like, we don't know when we will go back to this, uh, but when we are going back to it six months later, so it's like, it eventually comes back to you. Uh, so success also looks like learning. Um, other things that you might looking at might be looking at success in the civic sector, and you start seeing more uh, probably quantitative numbers, and it's like tracking in the case of the program that I'm, I'm in, it's like how many stores is the program in or how many SNAP beneficiaries are taking, like really using the program just because that you need to track those things in order to prove success. And especially you're, we're working with funds. So we need to like really uh, be accountable of how we're spending uh, our dollars and what those dollars are coming and are creating. Catalina, could you could you say those those items in the reflection again? That was really fantastic. Uh, what one like uh, how? For monums, monums, yeah, 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 yeah. What what are those items again? Uh, that was so really it fantastic. On the report, but usually it's like what we did, how we did it, what did we learn, and how can we do it in the future, or what are future uses. So usually the reports go into those four um, like big questions uh you will we will detail for example the one that i was part in we really detailed on how the chatbot was put up just because it was so challenging so the next person that gets into this same position so like has already a backstory and doesn't start from zero and that's very like usually in the public sector you move slow and you don't remember what's been done two or three mm -hmm. years behind so this is a very interesting way of building capacity inside the public sector as well. Yeah, you're, you're building a history, right? That you can refer to again. And then you also mentioned um, about uh, oftentimes the success will look like quantitative metrics, right? In, in your experience, is that, uh, you know, with the teams that you've been working with in, in Monum, is that seen as something, those quantitative metrics, is that seen as something that uh, is integral um, to what you all are, are curious to learn? Or is that, is that something, um, a little bit of um, making sure that you're checking the boxes for the client because that's really what they're interested, you know, kind of a bit of a hybrid. It's an integral, uh, really. Uh, like there's, like you've got the qualitative and when I did the report in the summer, it was both quantitative and qualitative. Like we were looking deeply at how people responded and, um, what were the responses that we had quantitatively but we also spoke with them like I did have calls with residents out of the blue and just ask them what how did they feel about the service and just didn't like feedback normal feedback what we usually do in uh 
ID, like interviews and how did it go and what could we do better next time? Because I was just at the end of the project. Uh, but quantitative does come in the public sector uh, quite a bit. Like we do work with data and that's something that I would be lying if, at least from what I've lived, I would be lying if I would say that it's not important. Yeah. Shannon, you mentioned that oftentimes uh, what a, an innovation team or you know this type of thing within many different city, city governments might look like is sort of a, a, a data analytics team or something like that. Is that right? Um, yes. <laughs> so, um, what is, what is, I'm, can you clarify the question? Yeah, yeah, you know, I, I just, uh, why don't we come back to the original question, which is what, what is, what is the, uh, the, the impact that a civic designer can have? What have you seen? What does success look like? Yeah, Cat Catalina just like nailed a lot of it down. Um, I think, so for my team, my office, a lot of what they're looking at is, I mean, they're looking at customer satisfaction for one, um, which also trickles down to how we have success metrics within the organization. Um, so to us, if our customers are happy, it's because we're meeting those metrics and, and a lot of those metrics are based on our residents being served and, um, so it sort of trickles up for, for me and my role and, and my smaller team success, I think, because we're the only, we're the main ones accountable to, are we getting the voices at the table that need to be heard? And are those being implemented into the solutions that we design? You know, above that is, you know, are we making a process more efficient um, and more effective? Above that is, <laughs> Um, are we being resource smart and saving money a lot of times, you know, because that's, that is just like the nature of how it works. So it's a lot of like translating those metrics and connecting them. Um, yeah. A, I know we're on framework. the same schedule, so I'll leave yeah, it there. That's a good, that's a good framework. Um, Steve, any quick thoughts before we, before we kind of wrap up? <laughs> Yeah, the impact you can have. So yeah, that's a couple of threads. One is just, yes, it's really important and critical to measure your, whether you're gonna use OKRs, like objectives and key results or key performance indicators. If you're talking about, uh, for example, like va.gov, Veterans Affairs, the, the relaunch of that site, which was uh, a few years ago now, about the escalation or an increase in participation on the part of veterans. You know, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but it was a huge, jump, uh, which suggests, and the satisfaction ratings uh, were elevated too, which suggests, suggests that clearly this is a much better experience. Veterans are able to get to their benefits in a much more user-friendly uh, manner. Um, it actually gets them where they need to go. And I mean, we're talking about millions and millions of veterans or healthcare.gov. Uh, I mentioned that a little bit earlier. I mean, that affects millions of Americans. Like, so you could have a serious impact on um, the, a number of the U.S. population, yeah. <laughs> I would say. And, you know, another example, and I might be able to drop a couple of these in the chat, but the, the ATF did some fantastic work on, with the Civil Rights Division and the Department of Justice in modernizing their civil um, rights complaint portal. So if you feel like you've been the victim of civil rights, that is a far better user experience now, which allows uh, for a couple of things. One, for the people who um, filed the complaint to have a better experience and actually get feedback on what's happened. How is the DOJ taking action? But then on the DOJ side, they're actually able to do better analytics and see where the trends and complaints are coming from and then allocate their teams accordingly. So again, when COVID rose, you are gonna, you're, you're seeing a spike in, you know, or a trend in, in a certain direction. So then they can allocate teams uh, towards those sorts of issues. So um, th I mean, that's, I mean, this is hugely impactful, again, for the millions of Americans who file a complaint or uh, need access to uh, their health records. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can go on and on, but I mean, this is, this is, this is, this stuff matters, uh, whether it's yeah. at the state level, city level, or federal. Great. Thank you all. Um, we'll shift to, to the Q&A. Krista? 
Here, I'll come back over here. Okay, yeah, we've had a lot of really, really good questions um, that I've been kind of monitoring throughout. So thanks for your patience, everyone. Um, a really great one from uh, Amanda Geppert. Hi, Amanda, if you're still on, uh, PhD uh, alum of ID. So she is directing this to Shannon and, and Catalina, um, given your, your roles. Um, she says, given that you're the first designers in roles like yours within your organization, what's one thing you've learned along the way that you wish you would have known when you started? And, um, you know, alternatively, what's one thing you would have done differently at the beginning, um, knowing what you know now? So uh, let's see, Catalina, we'll, we'll throw it to you. And I can throw this in the chat so you can see it there as well. Great. Uh, so first is what I would have done differently. Wow. Uh, first thing, you're always going to have a lot of meetings. I think that's something that you don't you don't come prepared enough. Like that's something that happens in the public sector. I think my first two weeks in Monum just were like full of meetings. Uh, what I could probably I would have done more connections at the beginning in my time in Monum. Uh, like we did have a couple of people that I met. Uh, just because it was one on one and then didn't follow up, but it would have probably for the work I'm doing right now, probably would have been better to build that connection since then than right now. Uh, and some of them that I didn't do that right now are better off. So like taking care of that connections uh, better. And what was, I think it was a double question there. Uh, and the other one was, it was just rephrasing the question. It was mainly that. Yeah, all great. <laughs> Shannon, over to you. Um, yeah, two, two things come to mind. Also, hi, Amanda, <laughs> if you're still there. <laughs> um, one of them is, is fairly specific to my teams, so I'll just keep it brief. But the way that, that Bloomberg Philanthropies was set up, where we had these big, grandiose challenges that used resources that didn't really um, affect the internal stakeholders that much. Like we were very external when I first entered the city. And so we were, we were partnering with a lot of community organizations and um, doing really meaningful work, but it ended up kind of ostracizing us to some degree with the rest of the organization who, who then we had to build relationships with um, who only had seen us from this, this one perspective um, and didn't, it was harder for us to make those connections about how we would, we could work together. Um, but, but sort of more generally speaking, something else that I've learned is when there, when you do enter a partnership, I think we were striving so much to make those connections and relationships and bringing value that uh, scope, scope creep had come in to how we were working together. Um, so MOUs became really important. And just like, just even as a self-reflection tool of like, actually, what is it that we do? What are we gonna do here? And um, you just have a shared document, then you can go back to, but um, it, it becomes much more clear and it can change over time, but um, that's been a big learning boundaries. Right. So another really, really good question came through um, for all of you, any of you who would like to answer, um, and it was around equity and allyship. So how are you, uh, you know, understanding that and addressing that within your work? And how are you, you know, and even to include bringing diverse perspectives into the decision making process? So um, they're curious what kind of effort you have seen um, to, to make that happen. So I will keep this open to whoever wants to, to start. Um, I, I guess I could start to speak to that. Uh, certainly in my current role, uh, artificial intelligence is a uh, obviously a hot topic these days as an emerging technology and diversity, equity, inclusion, and the broader issue of responsible AI and ethical AI, ethics and AI is, in, is hugely important. And so I think 
we're trying to bring that to the forefront in the conversation. So we, we have an AI community of practice within the federal government that has about a thousand people in it. Um, and we have a, um, a working group focused on responsible AI and again, bias and transparency and fairness. These are all the issues that we are uh, very, um, certainly cognizant of, concerned about and, and wanna make sure that we, we do it right. And um, because again, things can go wrong with AI. And so it's this, it's this balance of, and a trade off of how do we make sure that we tr give ourselves the, the ability to experiment and, and recognize that we will um, get things wrong but how do we make sure that we learn from those experiments and put in the practical mechanisms and processes to make sure that we have uh, a good representation of the data in the data set or data sets and the right people uh, that have good representation um, in terms of uh, gathering the data itself. I mean, these are all very important and very top of mind issues that lots of folks uh, are, are having in government and beyond. So um, that, Again, it's hugely important. And again, a design mind is, is, is hopefully and should be, uh, it should be top of mind for them too. Great, thank you. Um, so there's a lot, a lot, a lot of questions around resources. So we've got some you know, uh, fellow designers or, or those who want to start using design um, within their work. Um, so would love to hear from, you know, all of you, uh, are there particular resources you go to books, blogs, podcasts, uh, is there a community, is there a community board somewhere where you're all talking about the work, um, would love to just hear more about how you continue to learn, um, and, you know, improve your, your practice. Um, Evan, you want to take a stab? Yeah, I can, I can jump on the, I, I was just unmuting myself. Um, I haven't found any, um, you know, um, message boards or whatnot. Uh, the other three of you, if, if there, if there are some, let me know. Um, but what I found to be very effective is, um, weaving into my story that I, I, you know, when I speak to others about what I do and what my interests are, uh, I very much speak about where I want to go, um, which is very much um, kind of in, in, in local government, um, you know, in the trenches, uh, in, engage interacting with communities. Um, I also have a big interest in, in, in urban planning, physical built environment, et cetera. And I'm giving you some of the spiel now. Um, but what's been effective, uh, why that's been so effective is because um, by putting that out at the forefront uh, for those whom I meet, uh, it really um, it, it allows them a way to make connections potentially because they know what my interests are. Um, for example, um, here at the um, there's a there's a meetup group in DC called uh, Design Thinking DC, and um, I, I've uh, had some great you know one-on-one -on -one conversations with the director of. Um, of that sort of meetup group. And, uh, and then I just, the most recent conversation I had with her was very upfront, you know, I just kind of share with her uh, what my interests were. And I was asking if, if there was, there was anyone that she knew. And she was able to connect me to um, the director of innovation for um, Montgomery County over here in Maryland. So he and I have had some great conversations, really, really um, enjoyed, um, you know, picking his brain, um, but that never would have come about uh, if I wasn't upfront and, and vocal about what my interests were being here in city government, et cetera. Yeah, um, my world has shifted a little bit. I'm, I'm uh, still using design, but in, in this new role of AI, but if you're interested in AI, which I think you're, if you're not now, you're going to need to be soon. <laughs> um, but there's uh, books like Weapons of Math Destruction um, is one that I think is, is interesting. Um, I'm blanking on the super intelligence is another one. I can't remember if that's by Nick Bostrom, but um, those are a couple of things, but that's AI that's not really designed per se, but um, you know, John Mega, John Meta puts out his design and tech report, I think is the name of it, or that might be a little off, but yeah, okay, nodding heads, good. Um, that's, a, that's something. And then um, I can also, let me just grab a couple of resources on, and I, by the way, I just dropped that piece in the, in the chat thread uh, by a former CTO, um, 
on the previous administration with somebody who knows names like Sinai, that gives you a little bit of color of what healthcare.gov and how that evolved to see some great work at CMS uh, that was done. So, I mean, this is like, I remember back at, I mean, Chuck Owen, this is like the aspiration of like, how do we get design and policy making sort of uh, woven together? I did some grad school project on that. Um, so, I mean, this is, re this is really coming to that level. And so uh, those are at least a couple thoughts and then I could find some other examples of orgs that you can um, engage with as well uh, beyond books and, and other resources. Yeah, one pops to my mind. Uh, it's on the West Coast. It's called Civic Makers. Uh, so it's a very good resource if you're interested in the West Coast, but they do host a couple of virtual events. They're into public sector and design. Um, another one that's, I don't know how commonly known, but they have a very uh, interesting community in Slack, uh, Designers for Good. Uh, and the one recent book that was released this year, which I've read already, but I really recommend is Meaningful Inefficiencies, which is about civic designers in digital era, um, written by a Harvard professor and a ex IDEO or IDEO um, employee. So those are three things that recently, so like I have in the top of my mind that I would recommend. Are we talk, Are we keeping this at resource, or can I, we could talk about organizations? If, if I saw a couple of questions, I think people are interested in how do I get involved or or where to go work. All right, well let me just drop a few in the chat there. Um, boom! <laughs> Look, there are this is like really happening. I kid you not. Like PIF, like obviously where I was, 18F, Code for America. If you haven't heard of them, Jen Palka, who founded it, has just done some amazing work. They know they have a new CEO now. Govern for America, uh, and then even at the agency level, and then and a group that I'm part of, uh, who's really interested in bringing more techies and designers into government is called the United States, United State of Technologists. I might have spelled that wrong, but um, U.S. of Tech, like, and I think they have links to other orgs. Uh, but there is just a burgeoning um, a number of folks that are are just standing it up. Like it's it's federal, but now there's like Colorado Digital Service, New Jersey. Office of Innovation, um, former founding, former co-founder of PIF, the Presidential Innovation Fellows is now the CTO of New York City, John Paul Farmer. Uh, and then again, all the city teams where Catalina Shannon are doing the work at the city level, which is again, like a huge place where the action's happening. Um, so those are at least a few. Oh, and then yeah, I'll need to wrap a couple of AI books. I have two, two things that come to mind right now. One is a shameless plug for um, a studio that I, I have never really been affiliated with, but um, some alum at uh, Greater Good Studio, they hosted a conference a couple weeks ago and I, I believe you can watch it still, but it was just the most satisfying conversation that I've had about, um, well, it was called the Restorative Design conference and the first time I had really been part of a, that deep and rich of a conversation about design and the future of design and like understanding the implications that of some of the harm that we participated in as designers just by the nature of you know the, the systems that we work within and um and the history of design itself and like a lot of the questions that we've had to face. And I know that those conversations are happening more and more, but that one was um, extremely, extremely good. And then there's another uh, resource that I have been getting more in tune with, which is the Design Justice Network, um, which is sort of, you know, framing a similar conversation and, and operationalizing how designers um, walk walk in in the world more, more humanely and like just do more of this activist work honestly because it's I don't think we can you know say <laughs> that unless we're really starting to like flip things over and those are two spaces where I've seen things um, challenged the status quo or whatever you know Steve's quotable moment of the night um, the, the confidence to challenge conventions. 
conventions. Yeah. I need that tattooed. <laughs> I personally believe like diplomacy is a, just, uh, that is a thing too. Um, I think Catalina, I, I refer to it on a number of occasions, like most days I felt like a therapist in a, or a diplomat. It's just not, it just is. <laughs> That kind of sort of leads into my next question, which is great and something I know we discussed um, kind of leading up to this event. So can designing government get past politics and bipartisan thinking and move towards solutions? And if so, you know, how, how might you do that? Because naturally there will be some bipartisan thinking. Yeah, I mean, I, look, this is, tech and design and innovation, it's, it's pretty apolitical stuff. Um, so like we're, we're an apolitical, or PIF is an apolitical organization, TTS is saying like, uh, regardless of administration or any of that, it, we're here to do good for government, good for citizen work. Um, and so uh, it's, it's really as simple as that. Like, are we focused on the citizen? How do we provide a better service at the city level, state level, et cetera, federal level? Um, and, and are we measuring the impact and, and measuring that we're getting better and better at it and getting those feedback loops happening. That's what this is about. So um, yeah, I think, and even, you're even seeing, I mean, there's even the org, let me try to drop this in the chat. I think it's called Tech Congress. So this is actually moving to the legislative branch. So beyond, to, beyond executive. So uh, let me see if I can find the website. Sorry, I'm gonna go like, off, but that's at least a, a, a quick thought on that. Um, but I'll let others weigh in if they want. And I'll try to find this. Yeah, that feels like a really big question. Can design and government get us past politics? I feel like that's just the question that everyone <laughs> wants an answer to, especially mm. um, right now. Um, my optimistic side says of like of, of course it's worth trying <laughs> I, I I'm gonna kind of like bridge this to the previous question about the equity piece and some interesting conversations that have come out of my department which so I my office is within the budget department um, so there's been a lot of serious conversations around responding to um, you know, topical, political um, things. And just one being the very real conversation around what does defunding police look like? I'm not, I'm not trying to like open this can of worms in the last five minutes, but um, I have two, two colleagues of mine who were sort of leading this particular conversation and, and around normalizing, um, racial like equity conversations in the organization. And then um, the other one was basically operationalizing and like policy building um, with this piece. And, and, and there was an agreement that we have to do both with, you know, and, um, and we are doing both. And we sort of, the way we're positioned in the organization is because we touch every department, we have the opportunity to lead that in many ways and in, in some ways departments are looking for that because they're like help us understand how to do this um, and there's a desire there I'm also going to acknowledge that like I'm I'm working in the south it's a very progressive city it's just you know it's unique in its own way so this is just the way that we're having these conversations but my, my colleague my essentially my, my boss was like I'm not really interested in changing hearts I'm I'm interested in like embedding policies. And so it just becomes this interesting conversation about where to, where to draw the line. And at some point, um, I don't know. I, I don't know that the bipartisan thinking it's, we don't have, we don't get very political in our work per se, mm -hmm. um, but with, work with the community you're responding to, especially, I mean, just coming out of the summer and right now and, government realizing that they they can't be as neutral as they normally would like to be. 
Yeah, the, I, I, Catalina, I don't know if you, if, obviously I want to make sure you got time, but there, there's something that I think is important to, to that's not necessarily uh, partisan. It's more about the divide that exists between tech and policy worlds. Uh, that is real. And there's a, an Atlantic article that came out about a year and a, or two years ago, maybe, about the Silicon Valley DC divide represents a, a, a national security threat essentially. And so if you were to Google something along like, there's an Atlantic piece that was written a couple of years ago, but you are seeing that absolutely play out in terms of uh, <laughs> when tech companies go on the hill and they, they describe what they have to describe what the business model is to senators, you are seeing a cultural divide. And so I've seen that uh, very, very close and personal uh, in terms of the engagement between the Bureau and tech companies. Um, but we, that's why we need designers and tech folks to sort of move, uh, get their butts, so to speak, into the DC or, and, and civic space because uh, it's just, uh, it, that, that divide, it just plays out in so many different ways. And if we can do that more effectively, we can actually move the needle on tackling some of these issues and, and building empathy in the context of, of, um, of whatever, whether it's housing, homelessness, Healthcare, you name it. Uh, but yeah, that's the that's the article. Thanks for dropping it in there. Anyway, it, it matters. Great. Thanks, Rick. That was great. <laughs> yeah, I see Rick's uh, <laughs> working for us here. It's great. <laughs> Love it. Um, so I have time for maybe one, two more questions. Um, so there's a great, great question. It was uh, directed towards Steve. So maybe we can start with you, but I think you know many of you could answer this. So the question is in your work in government, what is your perception of how far the gap is between how design strategy needs to be regarded to affect change versus your read on how these skills are currently regarded? So what's the, the, the gap or is there a gap? Um, yeah, I mean, there's still a, there's still a gap, sure, uh, but um, there's lots of headway that we're making, uh, and that's represented by, again, the U.S. Digital Service, I mean, at the federal level, for example, USGS, ATF, PIF, uh, Tech Transformation Service broadly, for sure, um, and then you're seeing agencies, whether it's HHS, they have a data science collab, um, VA that is really building out a product shop, like in the tech traditional, you know, in the real way, like a startup or a tech company would work. The, how do we build in agile methodologies um, and, and measure and bring in tight feedback loops and, and all of that. That's, that stuff is happening. Um, can there be more of it? Sure. Uh, but now you're seeing it again bleed like Catalina and Shannon, again, are examples at the city level. I mentioned the other digital services that are slowly being um, stood up at the state level as well. So it's just, it's, it's the, that's the, that's the mission, right? How do we keep driving and bringing more people? That's why the United States of Technologists exists to, to make sure that we bring in more talented tech folks and designers into government and create the pipe, the pipelines, frankly, for hiring and make that easier, which is, uh, that is a thing in and of itself is the, the hiring process for government. So there are efforts underway to, to address that too. Other thoughts, Catalina, Evan, Shannon? Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, so what I've, yeah, what I've seen um, in terms of the gap is, is, is really more um, related to awareness and education. Um, I, I've, as, you know, I, I'm not working within government, um, you know, but I'm working alongside uh, government agencies and uh, I've found the need to uh, to really take on the role of an educator, uh, both within my team uh, as well as with the client, as to um, what what design is, what these methods are, what what is this whole human centered approach? What does that mean? Um, a lot of there's a lot of buzzwords, right? And 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 buzzwords oftentimes, um, you know, they 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 sound nice, they can excite people, but when you really dig. Uh, underneath the surface, there's not much there, not much understanding or familiarity with what's there. Um, so uh, the gap that I've experienced is really in, in, in educating um, the, the people that I work with as to what the value is that, that, that the approach that I know and I bring um, 
can can really um, can bring to them. Great. Well, I see so we're keep about, keep oh. bringing more Catalina Shannons and, and Evans and others into into all the the corners of government. Like we just need to do that more. So uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> well, with that, we're about at time. Um, so I, you know, first and foremost, want to thank you, you four for joining us tonight. It was fantastic conversation. I feel like we could keep going if it wasn't 730 at night or later. <laughs> um, this discussion was was great. Um, and for everyone on the call, we will be sharing this out. So if you want to revisit it and revisit all these great links and resources that were shared, we'll make sure you have the ability to do so. Um, and one final thing, um, we do have one more event coming up uh, for the semester on December 10th. Um, it's called Chicagoland, a laboratory for 20th century design innovations. So talking about um, kind of Chicago's role um, over the past hundred years in shaping sort of our, our lived in environments. And so um, we will make sure everyone gets that link if you're interested in staying in touch. Otherwise, I just want to thank you all for, for joining us tonight. All right. Thanks Have for a good one, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.